Hey again, YouTube. Welcome back for another dose of 8-Bit Insanity. Uh, you may have noticed I changed the name of the channel, and uh, it's because I don't live in a basement or have a basement anymore. So I thought it was uh, false advertising. So uh, we'll just call this Retro Tech Insanity from here on out. So it doesn't matter where I live or what I'm doing, because we're going to do ridiculous things with old technology. So all that to say, I have... In my grubby little paws today, a pile of 6502 processors. Uh, these are not 65CO2s or any of the new ones that deal better with uh, static state or any of that. These are these are all the old-fashioned ones. There's a few different ones, though. Um, this is uh, UMC 6502CE on the bottom. Uh, I believe the CE model uh, was supposed to be uh, slightly less power-hungry. And then... Uh, this one above it, the, uh, let's see if we can get that in there, the Moss 6502, and it's got a number underneath it of 1837, so if that was really a date code, that would be the 18th week of 1937, um, <laughs> which I, I know the 6502 is old, but it ain't that old, so I don't know, yeah, I, I've seen pictures of these chips all over AliExpress and, you know, nefarious eBay seller sites and all that, so, um, when I went to order these chips, uh, I made sure I did not pick from a seller that had that, but, you know, that had that in their picture. Lo and behold, I got two of those chips anyway. They were like a dollar a piece, and they actually work. So if this one on the bottom, I went at it with some acetone, and I'm going to keep moving it back and forth in the light there. And you can see where, where I rubbed it with acetone, it, it, it did actually take off a bunch of the finish, so... Um, I, I think these things are, I think they're 6502s, they must be, because I plug them into things that take 6502s and they work, but I don't know that they truly are MOS 6502s, or maybe the 1837 where you typically have a date code with some special run of them for some other OEM that wanted them or something, I don't know. Um, I just found that chip kind of interesting. Uh, then we have some uh, UMC 6502As, which I think is no different than the the Moss 6502 AD, like the one on the bottom there that is uh, found in like uh, the VIC-20 and the 1541 drives. Um, and then there's one uh, SY 6502A. Um, it's that one second up from the bottom there. And I know it's kind of glary, so hopefully will be a decent shot of this. But at any rate, we got a whole pile of different 6502s, and the goal here is obviously to put them in a Commodore 64 that takes a 6510 chip, um, because, hey, 6510s are not plentiful. I mean, they're out there, but they're, they're getting a little more rare. 6502s, you find anywhere. So um, I run into some uh, interesting things I've learned along the way playing with these different chips in the board. Um, here, one other thing we'll show you is this adapter board. Uh, comes out of a guy here in New Zealand, actually. Um, ironically, I bought this while I was still in the States and brought it back to New Zealand with me, but uh, this is a little adapter board. I'll put a link below to the dude's store. I forget his name, but I have emailed him a couple times, and a uh, super nice guy, very responsive, helpful, all that good stuff. But this is a little adapter board that uh, essentially adds the missing logic uh, to the 6502 that makes it a 6510. Um, so without further ado, we will, uh, stop rambling and we'll get into, uh, some of the, some of the technicals and some of the things I've learned along the way here and see if we can come up with a solution for some of the problems I have run into. All right. So let's talk a little bit about the differences in the 6502 and the 6510. Um, you know, going past the uh, the I/O port stuff that was added in, um, the biggest difference is uh, a lack of a clock, I guess. Um, well, the the biggest problem I ran into, I should say, had to do with the clocks. And um, the the Commodore sixty four anyway doesn't use the the clock one out. It takes clock zero in from the VIC and. Uh, divides that basically into clock one and clock two. Um, I think divide is a bad term there. It, it uses it to generate clock one and clock two. Um, now, the 6502 family doesn't actually use 
the external clock in for anything other than generating clock one and clock two. It doesn't actually time anything it does off of that external clock, right? So you have, you know, this clock one is missing on the 6510 because they, they didn't need it externally on the board. And this is inverted from the input clock. So clock zero and clock two are essentially the same thing. Uh, they're, they're in phase with each other anyway. Um, clock one is the one that's, you know, 180 degrees out of phase and is not used in the C64. I'm willing to bet a lot of machines don't use it, but at any rate, um, Commodore decided they needed that pin for something better and, uh, and, and pulled it out of there. Right. So, um, all that to say, when we started messing with putting a 6502 into the Commodore 64, I noticed differences in this clock two output. And that's what we're really gonna focus on is the output of clock two on pin 39 here. And at least it's on the same pin on both chips, but not all 6502 family microprocessors are created the same. And we, we ran into, uh, uh, basically what it came down to was amplitude issues. The, the clock wasn't loud enough. Okay, so here's what I mean about the amplitude. Um, the 6510, this is what we're looking at now, is a, uh, a 6510 good old MOS, original Commodore 64 processor inside a AC64. And on the left, we have a, a scope capture of the 6510 with no cartridge in the cartridge port. And on the right, we have the uh, same exact machine and processor with a cartridge in the port. And there's very little difference between them. Um, by, by adding a cartridge to the port, you're, you're adding loading down to that line, right? So, you know, how much, you know, how, how much available capacity, electrically speaking, is available on that clock two output. And in, in this case, the, uh, the RMS voltage stayed the same, you know, 2.76. The, uh, uh, peak-to-peak uh, -peak and amplitude, basically the, this is within the margin of error um, the, the, you know, of this scope. They were bouncing around between you know, 4.5 and 4.6, and the peak-to-peak -peak was bouncing around between 4.7 and 4.8. The mean voltage was bouncing around between 204 and 208, right? There was basically no discernible difference uh, by putting a cartridge on the bus. Um, and, and there's a lot of other things on that clock two bus. The the SIDs on there, the uh, uh, the 6526s are on there. Anything else in the in the C64 that relies on on the one megahertz clock is is going to be sitting on that bus and drawing down some of the amplitude. And I, I I took turns plugging in and out 6526s and SIDs and this and that and the other thing, and it really made very little difference to the clock two output on a 6510 processor. Uh, he was able to, you know, basically maintain the same amplitude, you know, within, you know, some, some fractions of a volt here, some hundreds of a volt uh, with, you know, with various things on and off the bus. So the, the 6510 will, will say he, he has a strong output. There's a lot of torque on, on, that, uh, on that clock two line. Now, unfortunately, we can't say the same thing about the 6502 chips. And I noticed this across all of the 6502s that, that I tested, everything I showed you on that little anti-static pad earlier. And right off the bat, if you notice that the, the 6502 with no cart in it, its numbers are quite a bit lower. Um, you know, our, our uh, uh, peak to peak voltage is, is down about, what, four tenths of a volt. All the voltages are down. And then when you go and actually insert a cartridge in there, right, you lose even more amplitude off of it. There, there was significant amplitude losses by loading more things on the data bus or on the clock bus, the clock line, I should call it. It's not really a bus. Um, but uh, yeah, there's, you know, everything, everything took a hit across the clock line by adding a cartridge. And I did the same kind of testing where I added and removed the uh, 6581, the 6526, both 6526s. And the, the 6502 processors just aren't able to, to keep up with 
the necessary power requirement you know of the output of that clock and uh, one of the chips even that that low power uh who was it low power umc chip that one actually when when i put my probe directly on pin 39 on the processor to to take a look at it uh the the computer actually stopped running um and the cursor started doing weird things and what that tells me is that i no longer had enough amplitude to properly drive the one megahertz clock into the 6526 chip um you know that, he's responsible for running the cursor and the io and all that right so um so now I'm noticing that, hey, the, the clock two output across these chips is not the same. Um, the the MOS 6502 AD chip, he handled it the best. And I had very little problems with him. Um, but the uh, all the other ones out there, um, even the those uh, you know uh, pseudo MOS chips, I'll call them, the ones with that, that weird date code, the 1837 date code, uh, they didn't handle the, the load on the clock line as well. The uh, uh, That uh, SY chip, um, I forget who makes those, I forget the name of the company, but he, he did pretty decent, but but even still, uh, he, he was able to run the machine, but when I added a cartridge, I, I started running some instability. Um, especially the Kung Fu flash cart, that thing is very, very picky when it comes to timings. Really, the, the 64 as a whole is very, very picky when it comes to timings. It's, it's, uh, there, there's a lot of stuff going on on the data bus on these machines, uh, you know, banking ROMs in and out and the, the things you do with cartridge, you know, not just the system ROMs, but the cartridge ROMs when you bank them in and out. All that stuff is, is very, very timing sensitive. So, um, and in fact, when, when I put a marginal PLA chip in there in conjunction with one of the 6502s, the system didn't want to run either. So um, the, the, the clock output is, is very, very important to making this machine run right. So um, what are we going to do to make that clock output you know, happy, well, and good? All right, this is where we get hacky and silly with all of this stuff, right? So we're we're back with our our uh, super tricked out Melius two fifty four oh seven based board here, and right here our CPU slot socket, whatever you want to call it. Right next to it is what used to be a ferrite bead number five, I think he was called. Right, so we have cut him open and we are laundering that circuit out and about with some jumper wires. Uh, that ferrite bead was the first hop out of pin 39 for the, uh, the clock generation, right? So we've broken that, so now the, the clock output from the processor is not going out to the board anymore. Um, let's see, let's move this camera a little. I'll we'll back up. All right, so this is the uh, uh, you know the, the side with the white wire. This is where the the clock pin is actually coming out. Uh, the, this white wire goes nowhere anymore. I just kind of had him for testing earlier. The red side that's what's actually going to feed our board. So we need a good stable in phase clock. You know, in phase with the 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 clock zero that gets generated out of our VIC chip. Um, so, luckily, as we we're talking about, the 6502 has an extra clock, if you want to call it that, that the C64 typically doesn't use, and that's the inverted clock coming out of uh, pin number 3 over here, right? Was he pin 3? I forget. Uh, anyway, um, we're going to take that clock and invert it a second time. So the, you know, the clock gets fed into this chip, and basically it goes through two inverters on the 6502 die. Um, so the first inversion is the out of phase clock that we have here sitting on this orange wire and the C64 doesn't care or use it. And then the, uh, you know, the, the number two clock is the one sticking out the other side. And my hunch is the, the inverters used inside of the 6502 for this uh, are taking uh, a fair bit of power away from the amplitude for the clock output, right? And by the time you in, you get done inverting it twice and you lose power going through those inversion gates on the die, that's what's causing that, that drop in amplitude. So if we take our uh, 
Okay, let's back up here. If we take our you know, our clock one, our 6502 clock number one, the, the out of phase clock, and we run it into an LS14 chip over here. You know, this is just a, you know, a, a hex inverter kind of chip. Uh, you can probably use an LS04, an LS14, anything like that, right? Uh, we're going to run it through that chip. So the, uh, the brown wire here coming out of the board is the ground for the chip. The orange wire is the clock input. The red wire is the clock output going back into our motherboard. And uh, actually, uh, <laughs> I use brown for both of them that just to make this you know good and healthy. But this brown wire is the hot for the chip, the 5 volts. This brown wire is the negative for the chip. And then I've got our, our scope lead on there. So if uh, let's, let's bring up our scope and we'll get the machine fired up and see what our clock looks like now. Okay, for the sake of some demonstrations, I've kind of normalized... <laughs> that's funny, this thing is not normal, but I've normalized the timing circuit and we've got our uh, our 6502 and an adapter. This is the uh, the low power, the, the UMC CE model. Uh, I put our, uh, our little ferrite bead line back together there so we're no longer using the the external inverter or anything um, so yeah we just have the uh, the the weak clock so to speak uh, 6502 running and here let's uh, swing up here and see the machine is running in NTSC mode and it boots up and you know if you're gonna do stuff with just an IEC device or something it'll probably work reliably just fine. Um, we uh, here we'll shut it off. We'll fire up in PAL mode as well and you can see the machines running in PAL mode too. It's kind of hard to tell with uh, with this kernel but you can kind of tell that it's kind of squished you know like the PAL ones look. So anyway we're gonna turn it off now and we're going to insert our Kung Fu flash cart and this cart is one of the most picky when it comes to timing. It's uh, the, especially in NTSC mode. Um, so if there's going to be a test of timing circuits in a 64, I'd say this is it. So if we fire the machine back up, we just get a black screen. If we hold the Kung Fu Flash button to make it go into its little diagnostic mode, it does nothing. It's just dead as they come. Now the timings in PAL mode are a little easier to deal with because PAL runs a little bit slower. So if we boot up in PAL mode, it kind of starts. We get a ready prompt instead of Kung Fu Flash. Here we'll, uh, we'll hold the Kung Fu Flash button and now nah, we just have a flashing light on the Kung Fu Flash. doesn't even want to go into its little diagnostic. Try it again. Nothing. We'll reboot the machine. See, it almost wanted a boot, but we have no cursor. All right, so we got into the diagnostic this time. Now, if you know, if you if you remember, the uh, the clock on a PAL C64 is supposed to be 985 kilohertz. This is showing it's 1.36 meg, which is neither NTSC or PAL, and it actually hung. It should be incrementing up over and over, and it's not. It's just sitting there hung. And uh, in fact, we have our, uh, I don't know if you see it in the camera, but the, uh, the light is flashing on the Kung Fu flash like it's in some kind of weird error state. So here, let's, uh, let's reboot them one more time, see if we can get it to do something different. All right, we got a ready again, and it's all flickery and weird. And yeah, I can't even get it to go back into diagnostics. Nope, nothing. All right, we'll give it one more shot. Oh yeah, it's pretty that time. <laughs> and again, this is like memory timing issues more than anything probably, but... All right, we got the diagnostic to come back. And if you notice, the clock keeps incrementing. Like, it, it will keep going up and up if you let this sit for a while. So 
so yeah, it's obviously very angry at that at that V2, the clock two output from the processor. And for grins, we'll try NTSC one more time. But uh, NTSC and this particular processor, I've never really gotten much out of. All right, so let's shut him off. I'm gonna swap to a different processor and see if we can get some different results. Okay, this is the UMC 6502A processor on uh, NTSC mode, no cartridge, and we are booted seemingly reliably. Uh, just for grins, we'll boot up in PAL mode. Yep, and PAL is working. All right, let's put our Kung Fu Flash in. And, uh, oh, that's right, I had the uh, file browser running last time. So yeah, we can actually get our Kung Fu Flash to come up. And also notably, I had a roll back to 1.42. The 1.43 firmware did not want to work with uh, with a 6502 processor at all. So going back to the 1.42 seemingly relaxed some of the timings or tightened them up. I don't really know. Um, but I know that there was a timing difference, especially in NTSC mode from 1.42 to 1.43. Um, anyway, I rolled back to the 1.42 Kung Fu Flash firmware to get it to work at all. Um, and we are up in, in PAL mode and let's go into the little clock diagnostic and yeah, we're bang on 985. It's steady within a couple of Hertz. So I think we, I think we could say we're stable in this configuration. I'm going to go to NTSC now with the UMC a chip and uh, Kung Fu Flash did come up. Well, that's a, a rarity. It sometimes doesn't. Oh, well, actually, this chip is pretty happy today. So yeah, our clock is stable for, for uh, the UMC chip. The UMC A variant, I should say. Right, let's, uh, let's pop him out. I'll go grab another chip. This is one of those funky rebranded or whatever wannabe MOS chips. I don't think they're genuine, but uh, it is some kind of 6502. And all these chips had mangled legs from the uh, from the vendor, so I'm gonna have to wrestle this thing in there. Come on, buddy, you've been in there before. He doesn't want to go in. I'm going to have to straighten these legs. Give me a sec. All right, we've got one of the uh, uh, rebranded, remarked, whatever they are, wannabe MOS chips in there with the Kung Fu Flash cart. We're in PAL mode. We'll give them a little juice. And it's trying to load, but it doesn't want to. Let's see if we can get the diagnostic to fire up. No, no diag. We just have the error light on the Kung Fu Flash. Well, let's see about NTSC mode with this guy. Nah, there again. Like, look, it's trying to load, but it's puking and freaking out. Try for diags. Oh, we get in the diagnostic. Yeah, but look at the clock. It should be, you know, 10227 whatever. And we're at 1.18, 2, 3. Four. And I've let this run for a while before and it will keep incrementing over time and it'll it'll wind up completely out of whack and it'll finally completely lock up. But yeah, this just goes to show you not all 6502s are created equal. I'll give them a reset. Hey, we actually got in. Let's try to try to load something. We'll try to load a demo. Yeah, and it won't load the demo. And I know that demo would load. Um Try back in NT or in a uh, PAL mode. Um, PAL, we got nothing, and usually PAL's the one that works better. So, uh, yeah, all right, we'll uh, we'll try one more chip here, just see how it behaves. All right, now we've got the uh, the SY. I looked it up. It's Cinertech, the SY sixty five zero two in there. In our Kung Fu cart, 
And we're in PAL mode. And yeah, here we go. We just have a flashing ready. And I don't mean a flashing cursor. I mean all the text was flashing. Oh, there we go. It's loading this time. And the demo actually loaded. You would hear sound had I hooked up the sound. But uh, <laughs> now let's see. Uh, how does this chip like NTSC? Yeah, and here we go. It doesn't want to load. Try one more time. Black screen. Let's try for diags. Nothing. Black screen. Let's look at the clock in NTSC mode. See if it'll let us in. Not nah, even there. Device not present. Doesn't want to load. I can't get the diagnostics to load either. All right, got it that time. And yet yeah, we're in PAL mode now. And it's showing a 1.09 and climbing clock. So yeah, the, the like I said, the Kung Fu Flash is, is very particular about timing. It needs to be for for all, all the cool stuff it does for us. And, and these aftermarket 6502Z, even that uh, that other Moss 6502 is a, a little a little pissy. Let's try let's try. An actual authentic. I know this is a real Moss 6502. A pretty late one too, from 1989. And uh, let's see if he wants to work and play with us a little better. I remember from the first time I did all this testing, this chip was probably the most favorable one. All right, so yeah, here we are and. PAL mode fires right up, no problem. Clock diags, bang on, 985, perfecto. And let's try NTSC. I think it was hit and miss if NTSC wanted to work. No, NTSC is working. Let's look at the clock. Clock will load, and yeah, the clock's bang on here too. And like I said, the the actual genuine Mosh chip really did work pretty well. Uh, only it, it would only hang up every once in a great while. But the uh, the UMC, that Cinertech chip, the wannabe Mosh chip, you know, they're they're all obviously 6502 processors. They just aren't all created equal. And for the sake of control and completeness, here we are with a genuine 6510 in there. Just to show you this machine really does work right. Hard to tell with all the crap I've done to it, but uh... Now here we are, NTSC mode, Kung Fu Flash. Fires right up, no problem, loads of demo. Diagnostic fires up, no problem. Our frequency is bang on, everything's all good. We'll kick it over to PAL mode. And yeah, he fires right up too. And yeah, this machine and the Kung Fu Flash are absolutely rock solid with a real 6510 in here. Alright, here we are back with our replacement and our... Uh modified inverter circuity thingy so we have our uh, our uh, inverted clock from the 6502 coming out of pin 3 over there he's on the orange wire coming into this uh, is this an 04 or 14 this is a 14 I've tried it with both and they both seem to work this is a 74 LS 14 um, we'll call it clock stabilizer circuit or whatever but so we're gonna take that inverted clock and flip it back around the other way and this is mimicking what the 6502 and 6510 both do and this is important you just can't take a uh, clock zero fee zero and run the whole machine off of it there's delay that happens when you go through these inverter circuits and that delay is important for the timings on the Commodore 64 bus on other machines it may not matter as much but the timings on the 6510 
are and and the C64 as a whole are, are just very very finicky. So you you need that double inversion to take place. That buffers you. I don't know if I had to guess 100 nanoseconds or something like that on on the clock. And that's everything you need to keep the the memory bus in time and everything working right. Um, if if you were to take a C64 board and blow it up really wide you'd probably have problems because you, you would blow those timings out just in the longer traces. I mean, that's how tight the timing has to be on these things. So, so anyway, we have our center tech, center tech chip back in there. Uh, we have our little clock bypass back in place. And uh, we'll pop in a Kung Fu Flash. And uh, let's see. Let's see how our little little clock behaves now. All right, fired right up into NTSC mode, which is pretty awesome. PAL mode's gonna fire up. Maybe? Hang on, let's boot him again. Yeah, there it goes. Let's look at the clock diagnostic, and bang on, 985, 222. Barely fluctuating at all, one hertz fluctuation, can't argue with that. Let's boot them back up as NTSC. And there we go, 1022-699, close enough. Typically it's 10227 something. Hey, there's my seven. <laughs> so uh, yeah, the uh, I would say that the uh, the CinderTech chip is behaving much better than it used to. So let's pop him out, and uh, we know that the the Moss 6502 is pretty stable. We're not really gonna bother with him much. Now the the UMC low power model, the CE suffix on that chip. This one was quite pissy too. Get back in there tough guy. These reclaimed chips can be a pain. Come on buddy. Alright, let me uh let me straighten them pins out, get them back in there. All right, there's our uh, our CE chip and our Kung Fu Flash, and let's see how we do. And TSC fired right up. Pal fires right up. No problem getting into diags. Clock is happy. NTSC mode seems a okay. Yeah, there we go. One hundred two two six ninety nine. So I'm calling this circuit a success, but it's ugly. So I got this other half baked idea that I do believe on this board where the MC, uh, what was it, the 4044, that uh, Motorola clock divider or whatever was in there as part of the original circuit, is uh, th that's the, uh, the same amount of pins, you know, it's a, a, a 14 pin dip. We could put this inverter in that socket and if we pull out I believe these resistors in Q7, maybe one of the caps, we're going to go look at the schematics, we can basically reclaim the socket for our own nefarious purposes, drop a chip in there and bodge one wire or two wires to get the clock as we need it, and uh, it'll actually look like a chip that belongs on the board instead of having this you know, big ugly breadboard and jumper wires hanging all over the place. So uh, let's go take a peek at some schematics and see what we can do to reclaim that socket.
All right, back on the drawing board here. Let's uh, let's take a peek. Here is uh, the the forty forty four socket U thirty two over there in the Vic section we were just looking at, and everything inside this dotted line here is actually internal to that chip. Everything outside of there is going to be hooked up to the legs of that chip. Pretty self explanatory. Um, so yeah, this is a you know a, a signal detector, phase detector kind of chip. Um, so keeping in that spirit, we're going to put something clock-like in there. So uh, I'd say it's a worthy upgrade. So yeah, obviously the, the chip itself is out of the socket. So if we pull out six, R16, R17, R19, those are the three resistors right around there. And um, let's see, we can... Pin 14 is power, great, because that is the same as the LSO4 and LS14. Um, so pin 7 should be ground, and it is. So uh, power and ground are going to be in just the right places for us. So yeah, this is great. If we pull out R19, R16, R17, and Q7, that uh, little transistor there, we will have an open socket, a vacant socket with uh, some some vias and pads and all kinds of stuff that we can we can tack our clock through. And uh, yeah, I think we can have ourselves a, uh, a pretty clean little solution to our weak clock issue. So uh, I'm going to go and desolder this junk out of the board now and we'll wire something up and see how it goes. All right, I've removed what is that? 17 resistor 17, 19, 16, and Q7, which should have pretty much abandoned this socket. So let's uh, let's take a little look, see, make sure there's nothing left behind. All right, so we should have five volts there, and we do, and then we should have a whole lot of nothing all down here we'd have continuity back over here and then that'll be a ground yeah that's right there in that ground plane nothing 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 we have a clock that must be the system clock that used to go in there the output from the Vic so that's going to be what pin one two three pin three is going to be an input to the second gate so we would have an inverted clock coming out on four and four is not going anywhere so you know what that's no problem we're, we're just going to have an extra inverted clock on the board i, I could just clip that leg off of that uh, uh ls14 if it turns into a problem but um I don't think I'm going to bother with that. I'm just going to pop the chip in there and wire in our clock. All right, let's figure out where we're going to put some wires now to get our, our clock going in and out. So I know that we have the one clock coming in that side of the chip, so we're, we're just going to stay away from that side of the chip. I don't want to mess with the, the system clock coming out of the VIC. Um, He's coming in there, he's getting inverted, and he's going to go sit on a pin somewhere. If it causes interference or something, we'll, we'll deal with that, but I don't think it's going to matter. So, coming down the, the right side of the chip here, the pin 8 to 14 side of the chip, uh, let me look. Alright, 8 and 9 is a, is a inverter, and 8 is the output, 9 is the input. Alright, so... See, pin 8's the output. That's going to be coming from one of these resistors we just pulled. See if I can remember which one. See if I can get on the leg. There we go. And it goes nowhere else. Alright, so this is going to be the output of our new inverted circuit. That output needs to come over. Can you guys see that? Let me back up a little. So we got to take the output of the circuit to feed our board, right? So really we just need to go to anywhere anywhere that clock would be on the board, anywhere the uh the phi two is on the board. So 
this would be the natural idea is to inject it where the clock used to be. But uh, let, let's take another look at the schematic, see if we can figure out a better place for it. If something's closer, maybe. Alright kids, we might have just struck gold here, right? So, in double checking my work on this socket here to make sure it truly is abandoned and everything, we know we have the one, uh, what is it, pin 3? That's one of these pins. Has the clock coming in on it already, right? Um, and that's the pin coming out of the VIC. So we have the system clock coming in. And really, all we're trying to do here is is amplify and slightly delay the system clock to feed clock two, V two on the board. So if uh, if we go here, pin two and eleven. Those pins are actually shorted to each other. That was part of the original design, if you remember going back on the schematic of the uh, of the 4044, where it had the phase detect and the charge pump part of that. They were just running one part of the 4044 into the next part of the 4044 by way of the socket, right? So, this is kind of neat. If we merely pop our chip in here, being that we already have the clock being input, to our inverter. We'll boot the machine up and uh, we're not going to get anything because we're not you know, like fully connected here yet. But uh, if we take our little... Uh, we don't need him. We don't need channel 2. We just need channel 1 here or a little scopey proby. You know, let's back it up so we can see everything. And uh, if we ground him, we already have our clocks on this chip. So, hang on, where's my trigger? Eh, let's just go auto magic trigger. There we go. So there's one clock. And then if we come around... move down. You know, where'd he go? Alright, so he's there. I gotta turn on the channel again. Hopefully you can see that on the scope. We already have both our clocks there, like the original and the inverted, right? So, if there's still enough delay, and it looks like there is, right? If we go and look at both of those, right? Now nah, there's a bit of overlap there, but we'll have to find out. We're going to experiment here. So this red wire is going to be uh, a fee two for our board. It's going to go to the SID, CIA's cart slot, all that good stuff. So if we put it on pin 12 of here, what do we got? 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, we should get a working machine. Maybe. Yeah, look at that. So we don't even have to come off the uh, Monotech. That was the name of the company, the Monotech board. Um, so this orange line we got coming out of the Monotech board, we're not even going to need to use. Now, in the future, it would be great if Monotech could basically put an external inverter on here, you know, on their module. Yeah, and there we go, 10227. We're solid. But if Monotech were to, were to put an inverter module right on their board, we won't have to do any of this. You know, basically an amplifier for that fee 2 for that clock 2. Here, we pull that off. Our clock stops incrementing and the Kung Fu Flash crashes. Oh, we hook it back up, it kicks back in though. Freaked out a bit, like it went into uh, caps mode instead of upper lower mode, but uh, yeah. I think we just wire this right into the chip there and we're cooking with fire. All right, so this is going to be a little half-assed here, but uh, what isn't about this happy little machine? 
happy accidents, right? That's a Bob Ross thing. Here, let's just sweep the leg here a little bit. Sweep the leg, Johnny. And, uh... We will just tack that right onto pin 12 there. Is this thing hot? Yeah, all right, let's see if we can burn ourselves. Here, let's get a, get a little solder on the leg of this bad boy here. not solid. This is kind of a pain in the ass. I'm at the end of my uh, soldering iron cord here. I can't get it to stretch anymore. But damn it, we're this close. We're gonna make it happen. Yeah, we just mangled the hell out of that. But, uh, you solid? No, come on. There we go, that's better. Survey says, boom, look at that. Well, I was pretty lucky having the clock there already. All right, let's go pal mode. Oh, the pal switch ain't hooked up. Hang on, hang on. Let's get the random bits of solder out of there. All right, now let's go pal mode. Look at that. Well, holy hell, it worked. Not bad. All right, well, uh, I guess that wraps this up. That, uh, that did the trick. We'll, we'll pull that little orange wire out of there. We don't need him anymore. And call this done? I guess that's that. We'll uh, pack everything back up. I'll, I'll put my... Uh, yeah, let's do that, actually. Because I took the other PLA out just to have room. So I could see what I was doing in there. Let's put our gal PLA back in. These guys are really good about timing, so I'm not super concerned. But let's... Uh, yeah, we still work. Make sure NTSC still works. Alright, so we are working. You know what? Here's one last thing we're going to check, though, because I had problems with the 143 firmware on this, and I think the good man that built this happy little cartridge had posted in his GitHub if you had problems on NTSC machines or something with the 143 to let him know. Do I have it on here? Where did I put it? Firmware. I would probably put it in a folder called firmware, huh? Yeah, here we go. Alright, so yeah, we're running 142 now. You can actually see this, right? Yeah, yeah, Alright, let's go to 143, which I was having issues with. And maybe with our, our new hokey little clock thing, it might have fixed it. Yeah, look at that. All right, let's, let's get into the diags. We'll actually try to load something before I call this working. All right, clock looks good. Let's see if we can load that demo. That's what I was afraid of. Yeah, it crashed. 
All right, so there still are problems. It's better though, there's still problems with the 143 firmware. Let's try it in PAL. Yeah, it works in PAL. Not surprised, PAL's easier to work with just because it's that much slower. Just a tiny bit makes a difference. Yeah, it's, it's crashing in NTSC mode. All right, well, let's go into PAL mode, boot him back up. Get back in here. Go back to 142. All right, we're on 142. Let's boot him back into NTSC. Alright, that makes me pretty happy. Alright, so, well, hopefully out of all this, I've learned some things about the clocks, and I've learned some things about Mr. Jorgensen's Kung Fu Flash, and I can give him a little bit of feedback on, on the 143 timing changes. And our friends over at, uh, what is it, Monotech Retro? What do you call it? Monotech Vintage PCs. Uh, I forget the guy's name. Like I said, I emailed him. Super cool guy. I'm going to send him my feedback on this too about beefing up the uh, the the clock output on this to you know, make it uh, make it juicier, make it feed a little better. But uh, yeah. All right. I guess that's it. I'm going to go splice all this footage together and see if it's a video that's worth a damn. And maybe you'll see this on YouTube. So uh, again, thanks all and. We'll, uh, we'll see you next time when I come up with a bright idea of some more crap to bolt to this thing.